Hey, you, wherever you are in the world right now, thank you so much for being here with me. We know that we're living in some volatile times and we know that the world is changing. So let's create a bridge as we travel through one another's countries, removing all labels, coming together as one people, finding our home in this one world. And as we do this, this is why our signature talk today is so important. Today, please welcome my guest speaker, Berliget Itzel. How are you today? Hello, Catherine, and uh, I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. And your pronunciation is very good. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. So Berliget comes to us from Aberdeen, Scotland in the UK. So this is a privilege to have you with me today. Thank you so much. And you're a mindset writer. And at the age of 38, within eight weeks, you decided to follow your dreams of eight years and move to Scotland. And this, and this was to make your dream of more than 15 years of you know, just to make this come true, to become this published author, which is really incredible. So thank you so much for taking some time out of your day today to be with our audience around the globe. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And I felt really grateful for, uh, you know, being here and uh, being part of this journey and, and this opportunity to, to share a little bit of happiness I hope uh, so. You you mentioned uh, the some of the numbers, some important numbers uh, in my life. I moved to Scotland from Estonia, which is a really small country. Um, its neighbours are Finland, Sweden, Latvia, and Russia from the east. So if you have a globe or a map uh, beside you, just uh, look up at that country. It has a small population, just 1.3 million. So uh, I, I really, I am very delighted to be here. And um, yes, um, I, I've always, you know, uh, loved writing. I love books. I remember books being my best friends. And uh, they've entertained me. Uh, they've uh, let me, you know, just... Let me be myself. I don't have to hide myself or my true feelings when I'm with them. And uh, I can take them anywhere. I can, um, they don't argue with me, you know, <laughs> but they do get me thinking. And not just the books, you know, we are not talking about encyclop encyclopedias or uh, some biographies or um some real you know thick study books but even uh, the the best sellers let's say um i call them adult fairy tales because they have a happy ending um they can get you thinking as well you know, just give you some life lessons and uh, the way to ask yourself some questions or Maybe it's because I'm looking for that kind of uh, information and, and, and looking the storyline but like this. But yeah, I've had some really, really lovely memories with books. And, and I think it's a good thing that many authors nowadays, you know, just give uh, sales and, and so many books have been published during lockdown. I'm not definitely the only one who has published their book during lockdown. Uh, and uh, there are libraries and there are ebooks and audiobooks. So, whenever I feel lonely, I grab a book. I really do. I'm not going to Netflix, uh, I'm not going to YouTube, but I'm grabbing a book. And it's very, very calming. So, um, I think my dream of becoming a writer and a published author was also a dream to share some happiness and uh, to provide this opportunity to think about yourself and your choices 
and just lately about a month ago i was going through my old notebooks they are 20 years old so i was uh, high school or, or first year in university i just so from some bro both years and i noticed the same type of writing and actually my mom told me that when i was a, at my first years of school i tended to end my school writing with questions so it was also like un not very traditional and uh, so because usually there had to be a conclusion but my conclusion was in a form of a question to get a reader thinking <laughs> So, um, yes, but I've embraced my talent I just lately, let's say within the last two years, maybe. And mainly because the urge to write was so, so strong that I gave up the fight and, you know, just surrendered to it. So That's I doing what I was meant to do. It too. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And what, I mean, you said you did a lot of reading and I know for a lot of people, when they do a lot of reading, they're escaping something else that's happening in their life. Was that true of you too? Were you trying yes. to remove yourself from something that was happening in life? Yes. I, it was like that because um, I grew up in, you know, it's, up to teenage years, I grew up in a very small village, and uh, um, the closest to my age was my younger sister. Um, she's one and a half years younger than me, um, and the others were about, um, let's say, two or three miles away, which is kind of a huge distance for a child to go alone. So. Um, my school was about eight or nine miles away and we traveled there by bus. So, or sometimes by car, uh, our mom, uh, she's a teacher, you know, she took us and took us back. So I didn't have a lot of people to play with. And uh, I learned to read very early. I was about four years old. And uh, I demanded for books when I was six and seven. So, um, yes, there are a lot of funny stories with you know about me and books and uh, how I had a flashlight, you know, reading under the duvet because I was supposed to sleep, you know, having this nap, and I had a flashlight and I was like reading like crazy because it was so interesting what I read. And the mom was really upset. Where, are, where is the flashlight again? <laughs> yeah, I, I got caught a lot. Of, yeah, but I always had a book under my pillow. I love that. And it's really interesting for people that are listening. You probably can hear the energy around what you just shared, because I can tell it just like transformed you into that little girl that you were. <laughs> So I could feel that yeah. too. It was beautiful. Yeah, I remember that, you know, the <laughs> excitement. And it was like um, a small adventure, you know. Can I get it through? You know, can I get it? was because I read a lot of adventurous books. I read about um, Vinato, uh, you know, um, um, Robert Louis Stevenson books uh, at a very young age. So usually teenagers read that. But I was about seven or eight. So, um, yeah, the, the Estonian uh, Air Force, I demanded for that when I was seven. You know, we were supposed to read the children's format, which was, you know, very, very thin. And I demanded for that thick book, which was in verses, because I thought that the thin version was for babies. <laughs> That's wonderful. So when so you're a little girl, you're reading all of these books. And as you start to grow up, I mean, you have this calling, it sounds like to actually write a 
book yourself. It sounds like this kind of bubbled up for you over time that you wanted to become an author, right? Uh, the dream of becoming an author, I think it um, started about 2006, so slightly before I became a mom. Uh, I wrote my first poem when I was 17 years of age. And this is actually the only poem I know by heart. The others, I tend to forget as soon as, you know, I write them, they're just out of my mind. And, and it's very often that I go through my poems and like, have I actually written this? So it's like, you know, meeting them again. Um, and uh, yes, um, I was about 25 or 26 maybe. And when I first had a vision that I'm, you know, a published author and, and I visioned myself how I'm behind my desk and having this laptop and just writing a book and I feel very, very important. <laughs> I remember that first time when I visioned myself. And um, of course I dreamt about, you know, just writing a novel um and uh, you know it's still there um but uh, i i loved reading throughout school through university uh i kept writing um i took it as journaling this type of writing uh but i also discovered notes that said that these are never good enough to publish, you know, when I was 19 or 18. So uh, that time I, ne I didn't have a dream. I just didn't dare to dream of becoming a writer or Who just getting published. Yeah, whose notes were they? Were they yours or someone else? Yeah, my own, them? yeah, my own notes, yeah. So, so that you, I wrote. Yeah. yeah, so you created the mindset that you weren't able to become an author. Yeah. Because you didn't feel worthy of putting yourself in that space in the world with your I writings. thought the, the ideas weren't worthy. I thought the ideas and the way I put them uh, are, you know, just hundreds of year, hundred years old and I'm not surprising anybody with them. I thought them to be just, you know, teenagers' thoughts. Okay. You know, just expressing myself or, or as I didn't have really, I felt like I didn't have anybody to talk to, so I was talking to my journal. So um, that's, you know, but there were some deep, deep things which I've published now. Of course, I've edited them. But I have actually put them out there. And they are on my Instagram. Some of the ideas from my notebooks from 30, uh, sorry, 20 years ago. Interesting. So, yeah. So how do you how do you go from this 1.3 million little teeny tiny country to just taking your life and uprooting and moving to Scotland? And is it just you or do you bring other, do you have family that you bring in tow with you as well? No, it's just me and my son. Okay. And I didn't, I do have some friends because I've made some friends uh, during my previous two visits. So um, I tend to say that there are two people that played a huge role of me coming to Scotland. Um, I used to work in a writer's museum in Estonia in 2011. And uh, my manager, her dream destination was Scotland. And I was like, okay, just let's organize a study tour. You can go to Scotland and well, I can discover a new country. My sister lived in Ireland during that time. And I had been visiting her and I never ever dreamt of living abroad. 
I kind of, you know, thought that maybe having the experience of working abroad for a while would be nice. But, you know, just selling my home and moving abroad, that was out of question. Actually, I had written a poem where I expressed my, you know, just how I don't understand those people who leave Estonia and they don't use their talent to, you know, just to develop our, you know, home country. I was very, very patriotic. So during that study tour, they visited the country home of Thomas Carlyle, famous Scottish author. And we wanted to touch the Highland cows who were at the other side of the fence. You know, they were so cute. And you just want to... And um, we were warned that just don't go off the path. Because uh, the Scottish crown may be, you know, surprising to say the least. But we still did. We didn't listen. <laughs> and within 10 seconds later, I was up to my knees in a mud. The cows were still the other side of the fence. I couldn't pet them. And me and my manager we were laughing. Just literally, we had tears falling from our eyes because it was so funny at the same time and I said out well if I'm ever going to live abroad it's going to be Scotland and I totally forgot it I actually did absolutely forgot it it was until 2011 when she reminded me that Birgit do remember what you said I was like no not really and she said well that was the case and 2017, uh, the reason she reminded me that was that um, me and my son, we had a holiday in Scotland. We had had a really tough time um, in 2016. Uh, and uh, so at the beginning of the year, uh, I asked myself, would you like to go to a holiday with me um, after the school year is over? And he said, yes. And we picked Scotland and we had an eight day road trip and it changed a lot. Like really, we, we reconnected and we found the peace in ourselves. And um, it was much needed time. And he was nine at the time. And when we landed back in Estonia, the plane was so, you know, just driving towards the airport it had landed but you know it was still on its wheels he looked at me and we both shared the thoughts but he said it out mom could we go and live in Scotland and uh, I started to do some preparations you know look for schools and and all the educational system I was looking for a job uh, I was discussing with my family and friends, you know, just how to do, you know, or what to do with the house. But I changed my mind. We both did. And we didn't, you know, take that move. Uh, until last year in August, the struggle in me uh, was getting bigger and bigger. Uh, last year in May, I started to write my book. Um, I started to write it as a personal blog, like a personal journal on Instagram. But in August, uh, after uh, our therapist, someone who I highly respect, told me that Birgit, you need to make them publish because people need them. And to be needed is something that has always triggered me you know we we all want to feel like we are valuable that we actually have something to give and i had lost that belief that you know my writing is something that has value i had been working as a journalist for 13 years i was during that time i was working as a marketing specialist and i still you know have hadn't that belief that my writing has value or I have a gift, you know, sort of. Um, so it, I had done my blog public and um, still I, I kind of 
you know, felt that struggle and I had every reason to be happy, literally. I had a big, big house, four bedrooms, big kitchen, um, a big garden around like apple trees, cherries, you name it, just, you know, everything. I had a nice car to drive around. I had a decent job. My siblings, my, my mom, my dad, they're all alive. My auntie, I had a very close relationship. Um, there were friends around me. I had really lovely neighbors. So a supportive boyfriends, a lovely child. We were healthy. We had just didn't have, you know, any reason to be, you know, going around with a angry face. And I still felt like, something huge is missing like I'm not enough for my love life and this life is definitely not enough for me and I was you know looking for answers and when you look for something you're gonna find eventually what you're looking for but it took a while it was last November and I did a lot of crying there were a lot of ugly tears like a lot but i'm very grateful for my best friend and she was the one who gave me some tough love and another day 4th of november i asked like do you have 15 minutes for me and she was like okay i, I do have 15 minutes and after we had spoken for an hour she asked me Birgit, you're 38. How long are you going to wait to live your own life and make your own dreams come true? You've been speaking for years how you want to live in Scotland. You've been speaking for years, even more years, how you want to be a published author. How long are you going to wait? And that was like a slap on the face. <laughs> and I know how a slap on the face feels like. It was very, very, um, it was like, I swallowed all my tears. I was like, okay, that's embarrassing now because she's very right. And, you know, I asked for 15 minutes and now we've been speaking for more than an hour and, and she's so successful and, and she's been so nice to me. So I better do what she asked me to do. <laughs> So, yeah, she told me, like, you know, book a call with uh, my mindset coach, and which I did. And uh, uh, since the next day, I uh, consciously started working on my mindset. And eight weeks later, me and my 12-year-old son, we arrived to Aberdeen on a city we had never been before. Because we liked the house the most. We had eight <laughs> houses all over Scotland we liked. And uh, we started to put that down the things we liked about each house. And the house in Aberdeen got the most likes. So we came here. That's amazing. So moving to Scotland with your son as a single mom, I'm sure that had to come with some challenges in itself as far as, you know, moving away from friends and family and living in a world where there's been lockdowns and government shutdowns to protect people, you know, from this COVID-19. I mean, how, how's that been for you? Uh, yes, of course there were some things, but I was so focused, you know, on, and I was so excited and enthusiastic about, you know, just opportunity to live my own life. So, it kind of everything fell into place. I got my house sold. I got my belongings sorted out. So um, let's say I burned all the bridges. There is no, there was no plan B. And this has been, you know, brought out by by many, many uh, people who, you know, have studied human mind. That when you have no plan B, you put all your efforts you know, to the thing and you, you have, you know, better opportunities to succeed. 
because you're not ha having those fear and doubts and, and second guessing yourself. Your whole energy is drawn to that. Of course, you know, the, the irony or, or the paradox of the thing is that uh, my relationship with my mom and my siblings and uh, many of the people there, um, especially with my family, it's better than it was when I left. And not because they were bad, or, but because I didn't know who I was and what I want. And when you don't know what you want, then it's really difficult to ask what you want. And I did, did a lot of blame game. Uh, I, I was expecting for support, but I didn't understand what support was. I wanted people to help me, but I didn't understand what help really means. Helping someone is not doing things, you know, instead of them. This is not helping, quite the opposite. Support is not having pity parties. It's having the belief in you when you have lost it. Help is teaching someone to do something showing them that there are opportunities. I didn't know that. I found out all this when I lived already in Scotland and while I was you know, getting to know myself. And uh, these 11 months, or let's say when we start from last year in November, this year has been really, really eye-opening, you know, finding out who I really am and and what words really mean, and what some actions really mean. Um, my, my son, before we came, uh, I wanted him to put down the positives and the negatives of moving here, because I didn't want him to get carried away of the excitement. I wanted him to understand, you know, that there are negatives that he's going to lose his friends, you know, the opportunities to speak to them. And, and he doesn't see, you know, um, his loved grannies and, and his dad and his siblings because he has three siblings from the father's side. And I wanted him to understand that, well, this is the case. You're not going to meet them that often anymore. But he said that he wants that opportunity to go to school in Scotland and to learn about this more, you know, having this experience. And my son has surprised me in so many levels, uh, exceeded my expectations, which is kind of embarrassment, meant, you know, for me as a mom, because you should always think highly of your kids, you know, have the, all the belief in them, but still, you know, He's so, so brave, and the way he sees things is just amazing. I wish I was like that when I was 12. He has already life goals. He has written down his purpose. He wants to, you know, just, he has his own small business. So he is inspiring me every day, and I'm learning from him, you know, just, even how he hands, handles all this struggle or, or the, all those restrictions that come with or have been with lockdown. You know, of course we have had our low points and, and things that we've hugged each other and cry on each other's shoulders because each other is all we have here. We don't have someone else to, to turn to or, you know, just, you know, I can't run to my mom, oh, he's been this too, like that. I can't do that. He's all I have, and I'm all he has here. So we, we really, really, this, this lockdown and this, these months have been really the opportunity to work on the relationship we have and to find ways to support each other.
it maybe is you know more difficult to him because he's a child and i'm supposed to be the adult but i have to admit sometimes i feel it's quite the opposite <laughs> so what what advice would you give to people that are living in a new country or a new place so that they're not feeling isolated? Um, there are so many networking groups. What I did, I was uh, looking for uh, other Estonians who live here and I became friends with a lady that has been living here for 16 years. She's been really, really helpful and very supportive. I also, we were lucky we had two and a half months because, or three and a half months before lockdown. So I was actually able to go out and make some real connections. But also I created a, a breakfast club. So every morning, 5.30, um, we gather with some ladies uh, via Zoom. And we have our morning routines. We do a little bit of exercise. We uh, write out some gratitude. We uh, do some opposite handwriting. Um, we discuss a bit mindset wise and, you know, just set our intentions for the day. And, um, you know, just you have to create connections. They're not coming towards you. So, there are opportunities there are facebook groups there are just be brave you need to be brave you were so brave to move abroad there was a reason you did that go to that base reason what you you know just what made you do that yeah and i i love the idea of just getting connected with other people in groups and i know in other recordings I've done, that was essential for everyone who had moved to a new place, is just getting connected to the community, whether it meant, you know, doing um, some volunteering work within their community just to reach out and build these relationships. And I think it's so, so important. Is your son doing that as well? Is he connecting within the community? Yeah, well, luckily, he has school he can go to. So, yeah, he's been uh, making friends and, and he goes to playgrounds, uh, you know, the skate parks. And, and it's very easy for him to um, create connections. It's way more difficult when you are 39, I'm now, and, uh, you know, just coming from a country where people are not, like, very outgoing. So there's a real-life story uh, from a real-life networking event. It was back in February, and it was for creatives in Aberdeen. And um, I saw, like, a beautiful lady. She had all those nice, you know, just dolly curls around her face, long hair. And I went to her and, like, hello, who are you and what are you doing here? <laughs> and she, you know, we were starting talking, and she was like, really are you Estonian I said yeah I'm from Estonia and she went back home turned out her husband had a art gallery in Estonia and they had been you know, just going back and forth in Estonia for 19 years and she went home and said Mark do you know what happened in this networking event there was a lady who came to me and asked who I was and what I was doing here. And you know what? She was in, from Estonia. <laughs> Estonians don't do that. They don't come to you and start talking to you. You have to go to them and start talking to them. And then they're <laughs> so shy. So, <laughs> so it was like really, really a uh, funny story. You know, it's very characteristic. And I was like, well, it seemed like a natural thing to do. So I feel very much at home here. It's, it, it feels like I was always meant to be here. You know, I, I love how, how people here say that, um, you know, mistakes is the only way to learn. 
and uh, yeah just coming back to your question how is my son doing that he has understood the fact that 95 percent of how you're doing is actually about how you're thinking mm -hmm. when you expect good good things coming to you when you expect bad bad things are coming to you and um, i've given him you know some things to think about like when someone's talking back because people teenagers are struggling they really are they they've missed each other during those summer months and, and spring and now they're struggling because we are adults and we kind of understand we that okay that's you know we are missing the human connection you know just that, that physical connection and able to face to face talk to people and uh, you know just with people from our age but they don't have those connections in their brain yet they don't they one minute he's like a small kiddo playing with toy cars and the next th thing he does just when you heard the door banging here, he was asking me, mom, can I take a cake? So there are just like two people inside of them that are, you know, just pulling one direction, the other direction and not being able to touch each other, you know, just figuring all this out, you know, they don't understand each other the way we do. Well, I was 38, I didn't know who I was. My son is 12 and he already does. Well, just, I have a lot of, lot of respect to, to teenagers right now because I think it's even tougher for them than it is for us adults. And uh, I, I've hugged him a lot. So parents, when you do have teenagers, and you know that they are not allowed to touch each other, you know, just the nice way. Just hug them. Really hug them, you know, 20 seconds at least. So they kind of have this memory in their physical body how a good, positive, physical human touch feels like. Because what I've seen kids and teenagers do here because they can't touch each other you know they're not allowed to put their hands over each other and you know do all the things we did when we were teenagers is that they've taken sticks and they play with them and this play this game is rather harsh sometimes but everybody's laughing because this is the only way they can touch each other. Or well, they hit, hit each other with bags. And they're always on alert. You know, they don't know whether it's attack or it's a play. And uh, so I've just given them, well, what you can do, of course, you can't go and hug your friend or just, you know, just to put, you know, arms, arms around each other. But what you can do, is you can put your back, you know, back to back, sit like that, feel that connection, it's there, shoulder to shoulder. You know, think of the ways you can do. And just, you know, just come and get a hug all the time you want to. So I, I, I completely agree. It's a difficult time. And it's, I had a show that I recorded with a massage therapist and she had talked about just putting your hand on someone's back or, you know, connecting, using the back and how impactful that can be just, you know, transferring energy to each other, letting that person know that you're with them. And I, I agree with you. It's, it's difficult. I've not heard about using sticks so that's something new to me and I have to tell you when you were saying this it kind of pulled me back a little bit because I was like oh my goodness I, I I could understand how frightening that would be not knowing if that 
if you're using the, the sticks for a defense, you know, mechanism, or if it's something else, I mean, it almost feels like it's a weapon of sort, you know, when you were discussing it. So I've not heard of that. And I, I well, definitely- Well, you need to keep yourself six feet apart, you know. So you they're using a stick you. to do that, yeah. I see. To, yeah. Okay. To, you know, uh, during the play, um, so the, I, I like the um, comparison. This is not my idea, but I've read it and I really, really like is that mind being a garden. Uh, and when you just take everything out and there's just soil, what happens with it? If you you know you've taken all the flowers out, you've taken all the carrots out. There's just black soil. What happens with it? The weed starts to grow. So if you're taking away the positive things, and you're not giving any positive to replace it with, the negatives take over. So what us as adults need to do more is to show our children, our teenagers, opportunities for the positives. Now, more than ever, just don't expect them to come up with a, themselves. If we are struggling, so are they. Yes. And we are adults, our, our brain and our nervous system is you know fully developed i once read from a magazine that a teenager's brain is equal to a brain that has been damaged because the connections are lost and then they are there and then they are lost again and then they are there and that explains why in some moments you feel like, well, I've done a pretty awesome job as a parent. And the next thing you ask, just two seconds later, who are you? And what did you do with my child? <laughs> it's definitely a difficult period of time for most parents, the teenage but years. Imagine, yeah, but, but imagine being that person. Yeah. Just one moment you feel like your brain is working and the next thing you don't know who you are and what you want to do with yourself yeah or how your hands are working or or where's your right foot or or whether it's the left one all over again yeah and it's interesting your garden analogy because you're sharing this with us and that's exactly what you did you pulled everything out of the garden and you started a new one Yes, but I consciously put positive things yes. to that. So there is less room for weeds. I put all my favorite flowers. I put some taddies. I put some strawberries. I even put a cherry tree, you know, to grow and, and just put the roots there. So I put into this garden everything I ever dreamed I wanted to have in my garden. Of course, some weeds come up from time to time, but then it's easy to pick them up and say, bye-bye. <laughs> right, because you recognize it right away. Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. Is there any tools that you can offer to the audience in regards to helping them during this time, whether it's you know adults or teenagers? One of the things that has helped me a lot is that we, the idea that we become what we think about. And uh, just, you know, go through what you're thinking just all day long. Whether there are things that you want or the things you don't want. You know, just listen to yourself talking. I don't want this, I don't want that. Or whether it's, I'd like to have this, I'd like to have that. So it's, it's the easiest thing to do. And it doesn't cost any money. And um, 
if you feel like there is a struggle, then look for the answers and you will find them. And one idea that has influenced me a lot, I'm not sure it's a tool, but I think it's a good thing to remember that nature is perfect. Do you agree? Absolutely. With, with everything in it, the winds, the rain, the storms, thunderstorms, uh, sometimes uh, there are colds, you know, just a lot of snow, uh, there are droughts, there are hurricanes, but still, nature is perfect. It has nights and days and morning and sunrises and sunsets. It's perfect. Human, you and me, every listener is part of nature. True? Yes. So if nature is perfect, changing all the time, no day is the same. How come that human as a part of nature is not perfect. How can nature be perfect if a major part of it is not perfect? Perfection doesn't mean flawless. It doesn't mean the destination. It means the constant change, the growth, the highs and the lows, the days and nights of our own life. So we can go to physics. Let's take a battery. There are plus and a minus. If you take minus out, there is no battery. There is a positive side, but there is no battery. And what I would like you to do now is, Catherine, you have a pen and a paper in front of you. I do who doesn't have, but are listening and watching us, just please, even with your fingers, try to draw a plus. Just draw a plus. Did you do it without drawing a minus into it? That is very clever. <laughs> so, you know, even the plus has minus in it. Yes. Does it make it less perfect? I think it's perfect because it has minus in it, but it's, it's the way we think and the thing we focus on, whether we see the plus or the minus in it. So yeah. I think, you know, this is the main tool. And you know, just watch your thoughts, watch how you talk. Watch how you speak to yourself and, and to others and, and because I believe that thoughts are energy. And you can create so much more positive energy around you by just doing those little changes that matter so much. This has been the main tool to get me here where I am now. Because as I mentioned before, I had everything to be happy, and I wasn't. Now I don't have a house, I'm, I'm renting a house, which is, you know, 50% of the size which I used to have. We don't have that huge garden here, we have a small one. I don't have a car right here. I have much, much less, I'm self-employed. I'm not working for someone else, I'm working for myself. I own less, but I feel like I have more. That's beautiful. I, I love all of that. And there's just so much that, you know, words of wisdom that you shared in these final moments with us that is just so beautiful from nature and changing and all of it. I mean, there's just so many things. So thank you for sharing that with our audience and hopefully 
it helps our audience feel as inspired and as good as it just did for me. <laughs> but I do have one more question. So if I were to find your earth angel feather on the ground and I were to pick it up, what would your message to the world be? First of all, look for ginger or orange colored feathers. This is <laughs> for me. Uh, and um, I would say that the message is live your life. It's the only thing you have right now. Even if you feel like you have nothing else, you have your life. And you can turn it around if you want to. That's beautiful. Fairly good. Thank you so, so much for being with me in this space today. And I just have so much appreciation for you sharing your story sharing about being a single mom with your son and the journey that you've had. And it's just very, very inspiring. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for, for choosing me, for picking me. And it was, I felt, felt well taken care of here. So uh, once again, felt very, um, uh, very grateful for, to be here. And, uh, Yes, um, I just want everybody to believe that you do have a gift. Just you know, find it, and and it is needed. Um, there is a reason you were born to this world, and it's up to you to find that reason. No one else can do that. Literally, no one. Absolutely, and just for the people that are listening, the reason barely get had shared finding the orange feather <laughs> is because she has she's actually a ginger as we say in the united states she's got orange hair so <laughs> it well, would be they're colored the colored I, <laughs> yeah yeah because um my natural hair color is uh like um uh, we call it you know just um unpeeled potato <laughs> So something between blonde and gray and brown. So this undefined color. So, yeah, but I, I've always felt like ginger is my color and it fits my personality. And, and yeah. It suits you well and it's beautiful on yeah. you. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for today. This is Catherine Daniels with Retreat to Peace reminding you always to find your authentic life with peace and retreat to peace. We'll see you next time.